Everyone in this audience has a stake in the game, one way or the other. We care about space law because it impacts our profession and our business. But perhaps most importantly, it impacts our collective journey as humanity explores, uses, and eventually expands our presence across the solar system and into the cosmos. So let's go back, and we're going way back, before the age of steam. We're going to sail. Late 1500s and early 1600s. Countries such as Spain, England, Holland, and Portugal were pursuing ever more ambitious expeditions to traverse the hostile, seemingly limitless void of the world's seas in search of valuable resources to exploit. Exploration flourished with rapid advances in ship design, mapping, navigational instruments, unprecedented movement and economic use. And of course, there was competition, not only for the far off resources, but over the ownership of the sea itself. And it turns out that was a great place to begin the journey of space law. So there was a debate about who should own the seas. One group was a British man named John Selden. And he argued for the idea that you could actually have a sovereign king a state, as we call them today, own and control the ocean. He said, I want to close them off. I want to be able to tax the movement of the ships across the ocean. I want to prohibit transport. I want to enforce my own domestic criminal and civil laws, regardless of the flag of the ship. Now, there was another group, also self-interested. It was the traders. And there was a gentleman named Hugo. And Hugo Grotius argued in favor of an open sea, a concept of commerce where no one owned the ocean. And he was doing that because the Dutch didn't have a large and powerful navy to enforce taxing other people. And they were really traders, so they wanted things to be open. Grotius uh, had an interesting insight. He wrote a paper in 1608 and he had a logic. And he said, you know, the air belongs to this class of things for two reasons. He was trying to taxonomize why the, the water and the air were similar, the ocean. He said, first, it's not susceptible of occupation. And second, it's common use is destined for all men. So I can't tax you to breathe the air. He said, for those same reasons, we should do the same in the ocean. It's limitless. How can you possess the ocean? It's been adapted by nature itself to be used by all. Now, what's interesting is, is the, the lawyers are actually on the, the end of the process. It's the government. It's the policymakers, it's the ability to enforce that was in driving the legal debate. But the lawyers had to wrap up the debate and they wrapped it up in a very interesting way. The logic of reality. And the logic of reality is, is you could only enforce closed seas as far as you could shoot a cannon. So you got about a three mile nautical limit, territorial sea out of that. And everything else was open. I, I just wanna highlight that because this is a really important point. We're all lawyers, but law, is actually the end of a continuum of normativity. And it's driven by reality. And, and the governments and those who make the rules are starting at a different place than the lawyers. They're starting with pragmatic questions of practical enforcement and control. And so when we think about space law, we actually have to start by thinking about who's up there doing what, because that's where it all begins. And the legal theory is irrelevant unless you have someone there able to enforce the norm, whatever that norm is. In this case, it was a cannon, but maybe it's not a cannon in space. Maybe it's a space station or a lunar rover or something else up there. The way it traditionally works is you have practice followed by custom. So from a normativity perspective, you might not have positive rules, but you have practice that everyone agrees to. In the ocean, originally, it was help a sailor when he's drowning. There was no rule at first but everyone did it because they knew it was self-enlightened interest. So the same thing usually happens in law. People will have customary practice and we're starting to see this in space law. And eventually you're gonna take that and you're gonna posit it. Law without writing and then associated enforcement is just normativity. So you posit the law. And then eventually, if you have different parties and we are in a Westphalian state system, different states at this point, they get together and they agree to their own legal binding contracts. We call those international agreements. Now, since you've got that basis, let's talk about space law. This is the Sputnik launch. Within 10 years, you had the first international treaty on outer space. It took 10,000 years of sailing to get to the first international law of the sea. Why did they work so quickly to have a treaty 
in the 1960s? Well, the truth is we were in a Cold War, and there was serious concerns about whether the other side might gain an upper hand in outer space in two ways. The primary concern was nuclear weapons on orbit, and the potentiality that the historic public international law principle of indicia of control and ownership over unclaimed lands would mean that the Soviet Union would be able to claim the moon. I want you to hear something about how Kennedy and how the country thought about that decade and this idea of, of going to the moon and being in space. And only if the United States occupies a position of preeminence can we help decide whether this new ocean will be a sea of peace or a new terrifying theater of war. So that was the philosophy. Let's go up there and let's, let's make it a sea of peace, literally a sea of peace. 400 years ago, it was the activities of the private maritime operators that drove the legal debate of the open and closed seas. Today, we are at the beginning of an unprecedented age of private exploration and use of outer space. And it is your creativity and innovation that raises novel space legal questions. The stakes are high. Our greatest hope to unlock the economic potential of outer space and enable humanity to leave Earth is via private enterprise. The raising and deployment of private capital, the development of new technologies and applications, and the risk-taking of fielding new products and services are necessary but insufficient conditions. We also need freedom and the rule of law.